I love you, Pastor Josh. Love you. Love you, Pastor Tom. Bless you. Thank you, Pastor Suzanne, and uh, for having us here. We're so excited to be here. It's an honor and a privilege. Angela, thank you for loving us. Um, I, I, coming into your church, I can feel and see Jesus. It feels like, it feels familiar. It feels like the throne room, heaven. You know, you should be able to walk into a church and it feels familiar, like heaven. Do you know that it's the first time in 16 years that Mike and I have been here in the United States during this season? For 16 years, we've been full-time missionaries, long-term missionaries in Thailand. So it's so neat to be here. Now, uh, we serve in Thailand, but I'm Japanese-American. I know all Asians look alike. I totally understand that. I do. And you know why I get it now? Because I've lived in Asia for so long. When I come back now, all oh, white people look alike to me. I feel like I've met you somehow or that you're all related somehow. So I totally understand the whole Asian looking alike. Um, but uh, we're three generations here in America, my family, and um, but our my ethnic group brought you sushi. You're welcome. Um, I, I can't look at you in the eye, but we also brought you the w World War II. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But for generations, we were here. Uh, people say you're Japanese. Are you ninja? I wish I was ninja. But I tell you what, I still can kick devil booty even if I'm not ninja, right? It would be helpful if I was. Um, but let's just ch have a chat with the Father real quick. Father, we love you. We're crazy about you. Jesus, we can't thank you enough for coming and dying for us, for being our substitute. We love you, Jesus. Father, we're here in church. We're gathered together in this holy place, in this holy gathering to not only find out how much you love us, but figure out how to love you back in extravagant ways, in wonderful ways, in beautiful ways, Father, that this week in between services, that we can practice what we preach and what we say and what we believe. Father, we're excited to be Christians. We're excited to be called your child. It's an honor and a privilege, Lord, to be with the family this morning in Jesus' name. Just a little background. In 2002, that was 18 years ago, we heard about child trafficking for the first time. There was a little missionary that came to our church, and she said, you can get a little boy and a little girl menu on the street corner. You can purchase whatever child you want, and you can do whatever you want to that child. The, the name for that is human trafficking and uh, child trafficking. So I'm not gonna stay there where it's dark. Uh, we had a tough week, didn't we, last week? And we've had a tough eight months. But for those of you who don't know, I'm gonna just skim the surface very quickly. Uh, what is human trafficking or child trafficking? It's the buying and selling of human beings, or it's the trading of the use of children for something that a trafficker wants. For sex trafficking, uh, it's uh, children are raped five to 20 times a day, sometimes up to 40 times a day, and they normally don't live past 12 years old. Uh, for labor trafficking, they're brutalized just as uh, hard, uh, just as horrible. I uh, met a young girl who was recovered from labor trafficking. She had 500 burn marks on her body. They changed her, chained her to a ironing board, and uh, she was eating plastic bags uh, right before her rescue because she was so starving and hungry. Uh, but when I saw her, you didn't even see a shred of her past on her. Why? Because Jesus was pushing out through every hole and just, just shining through her. You know, only God, only the one who made us can make us whole. It's such a miracle. Uh, one of our kids who didn't, she, we rescued her from uh, beggar trafficking, and they, she didn't bring in, she was short a dollar, and they picked her up and dropped her on her head, you know, and uh, her, her um, brain uh, split open, and, but miraculously, God healed her, and she's just fine. It's a multi-billion dollar industry for organized crime and greedy opportunists. 
It's not limited to just organized crime anymore. When we started, drug trafficking was number one in revenue earnings for organized crime. Number two was weapons trafficking, and number three was human trafficking. Human trafficking uh, soon eclipsed number, the number two spot, and what I he understand it here, it is eclipsed drug trafficking because drugs you can sell once, weapons a few times, but humans you can sell over and over again. You know, it flourishes. It flourished because nobody said no, but it's on the global stage now, and God's people are on the move. And it's not okay with God, therefore it's not okay with us. When we heard about it 18 years ago, we went home and crawled up into God's heart. And we said, you're a good God. You're a good Father, so we know you're doing something about it. How can we help you? How can we serve you? Just say it. Just whatever you want from us. It, about five days in and praying, it's a long story. But basically, we heard God say, I hear their cries and I need your life. And it was our burning bush. And we never asked twice. We said, done. And so 18 years ago, we started Zoe International. We're in five countries now. Um, there, he gave us two directives, and they, they've never changed in 18 years. The first thing is, is he said, I want you to share the gospel. I want to make sure that you reach places where nobody has ever heard. And that's really, we're not, it's not limited to just that, but it's really our passion and our heart. People that have never heard about Jesus, never heard about salvation before, that we're trying to reach them as fast as we can. Uh, there's, we're, we don't have a retirement plan. We're just going to go and drop over dead, hopefully in the arms of somebody who we just led to the Lord or a child that we just rescued, you know? I tell you, we're as passionate. I've been saved 53 years. I'm, as, I'm almost 60. I, I am, I'm as passionate about Jesus as I was Kazillion years ago. He's good. He's a good God. So who we are and everything we do points to one person, one person, and that's Jesus. Everything, every move we make, every penny we spend, everything we do, may it point to Jesus. We pray that they see Jesus. The world sees Jesus. Who cares about Zoe International? How long? That's just earthly. It doesn't matter. None of, who cares about Mike and Carol Hart? We can't do anything for our humanity. But he is the answer to every crisis on the planet. We carry the answer to every problem of humanity. His name is Jesus, that he would be known on the earth. Every move we make, Father, let it be so. Um. This morning, you know, it was so interesting. I shifted my message as I was praying. God says, I want you to just encourage my people. I'm going to try to squeeze in five to six stories uh, today. So I'm going to talk quick. But um, that's interesting. The, countdown, the countdown clock is not moving. <laughs> that's a miracle. That's awesome. <laughs> I think you need to start it. I want to make sure that we are honor, honorable here this morning. Um, so I want to start with the eight-year-old little girl. Uh, we rescued her along with a, a bunch of other kids, and she came as a very devout Buddhist. Now, here's the thing. We don't force kids to love Jesus or know him. We, we don't manipulate kids to love. It's not real then. It's not authentic we want them to love him and because they know why and who he is and choose him themselves. And so uh, she journeyed with us for about three months. We sorted out her case, and, and, and we, work, we work with government and law enforcement and immigration. And um, her case was she was able, safe to go home back across borders to her family who, were, who was waiting for her. She came as a very devout Buddhist little girl, but she left in love with Jesus. And you never know how much somebody loves G Jesus, or you don't know how much uh, God is in somebody until they're tested, really. And so she went back, and uh, her father called us a couple weeks after she arrived home, and he said, you sent us back a very respectful little girl. She's eight years old now, eight years old. And he said, but we bring her to Buddhist temple, and she refuses to bow. And she stands in the back and refuses to bow. She says, no, Daddy, Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Lord. And here's the thing about this eight-year-old little girl. 
Her mom and dad were Buddhist. All her siblings are Buddhist. Her grandparents, her aunties and uncles, her school teachers, her best friends, their families. The entire community, village, and surrounding area are all 100% Buddhist. She is an eight-year-old little girl who refuses to bow under that much pressure. And in our Asian culture, it's even more so to conform, to not stand and up when everybody else is sitting down, not in the Asian culture. You conform. So even the pressure for her was enormous how she must have been persecuted and laughed at and scoffed at and even hit. But day after day, going to Buddhist temple, she refused to bow. And let me tell you what happened. Several months later, the evangelist who had worked that whole area where nobody would budge, he said the, her family watched her devotion and her love for Jesus, and they all became Christians. And her mother, the evangelist said, is one of the greatest evangelists he's ever met. When you love the Lord for real, and he's everything to you, the people in your world, they're going to see. They're going to notice. It's the most attractive thing. The most attractive thing is you being in love with Jesus. If you have to use words then you need to. But I tell you, they're going to ask you, who are you? How many times have people, who are you? Why are you so joyful? What, what is it about your life? She was sweet and so courageous and so unselfish to her father, her heavenly father. You know, I, I was imagining when she wouldn't bow and she was under so much pressure. There's, you know, God sits on his throne in heaven. But I believe when he sees things like that, he gets up off his throne. He gets up off his throne. We don't bow. Christians, we don't bow. We bow to one and only one, and his name is Jesus. We live and stand for God, and he is faithful. In 2 Corinthians 5.15, and he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. He's alive. We serve a God that is real. He's real. What are we looking for? Are we, what are we looking for? Are we still looking for something? It reminds me of a little girl that we rescued. She was on the auction block to be sold. And um, she was still a virgin on the auction block to be sold. And when we worked with law enforcement, we found another little girl who was trafficked for some time in the same brothel. And so we brought them back both out, and it was a dangerous case, so we needed to house them in the, the safest place that we had, and we housed them together. But if you remember, one was rescued before she was ever hurt, and the other girl was trafficked for some time. And we knew they would tell each other their stories. So we were waiting for the moment that the girl who was trafficked for a while, she would say, what took so long for someone to find me and rescue me? Why did I have to suffer? And that was a fair question. Well, weeks went by, and eventually the two girls said, can we have Jesus in our heart? We said, yes, absolutely. Oftentimes, kids on our campus, they'll share the gospel with one another. They're so excited, you know, about who Jesus is in their life. And so the two girls uh, gave their hearts to the Lord. Now, um, I know there's a lot of, we're not experts in the field. There are a lot of experts in the field. But 18 years, you know, we watched uh, children heal from trauma. And experts can get kids only so far. And we use every kind of um, Bible-based therapy and um, scripturally sound therapy uh, known. I mean, everything you can imagine, but it gets you only so far. But the one who made them and created them, we've watched reach down in their little hearts and make them whole. Only he can do that. 
So um, when they got saved, they said, hey, can we have a Bible? That was weird. We were going to give them a Bible anyways, but why would they ask for one? Well, the girl who was trafficked, not the one who was a virgin, the girl who was trafficked read her Bible odd. She would turn the pages and she would read ravenously like she's looking for something. I don't know. It was exciting to watch, but we didn't know what she was doing. Well, after several months went by, she was on one of our balconies and she's pacing back and forth and she was shaking and tears in her eyes and crying and uh, uh, angry. She was so angry. So when we got to her, we said, what's wrong? And we thought, here it comes. She said, what took so long for someone to find me and tell me about Jesus? We said, what? We said, what's that? And she said, what took so long for someone to find me and tell me about Jesus? She said, I didn't know who made me. I didn't know where I was going to go when I died. I didn't have any peace. It was like, she described it like so much weight on her life. She would look up and say, does anybody even know I'm here? She said, he knew I was here. He knew. He knows my name. The Bible says he knows my name. He knows every hair on my head. We said, what about your earthly rescue? I don't even care about that compared to knowing who made me and where, I was gonna, where I'm going to go for eternity. She said, you're Christians, right? Nobody, she goes, 16 years, nobody ever told me about Jesus. No one ever told me about him. I would be mad too. I can't breathe. I pretended one day in prayer, I pretended that, uh, what if, God was out of my life. I couldn't breathe. He's he's amazing. To do life separate from God is not the plan of God. To do life totally engaged where he's involved in every area of our life is the plan of God. He's the only one who knows you and I. He dreamt you us up in his mind before we were ever birthed on the earth to be a pleasure to him and for us to be a pleasure back. She found that. You know, I, I was raised in the church, so I forgot what it's like to what it feels like to be translated from darkness into light. So oftentimes when I lead somebody to the Lord, I would look at them really carefully and I watch the joy of that. She was translated from darkness into light. That's that's a game changer. That's life changing. That's huge. If they really know what salvation is, if they really know that he's not just a religion, a choice, and just, you know, a little quick little prayer. No, oh my gosh. No. Staying power is knowing what he did on the cross. And that he's alive forevermore for me, for you. She lived in darkness all her life, but was translated into light. In Psalms 18, 20, it says, oh, Lord, you give me light. You dispel my darkness. Nothing compares to Jesus. You can look your whole life to be satisfied With this or that, it will not satisfy you. You will never find your groove until you connect with him wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly. To cling to Jesus. To cling to Jesus. When we see our kids make that decision, we know they're going to be okay. We know they'll be okay. Uh. We had these three girls that were rescued, and they needed to stay. They have families. They needed to stay with us until their trial, until their perpetrator's trial. And that took about a year. They were a handful. They were a handful and, and very traumatized, so angry and violent and frustrated and confused. Little by little, the love of God, you know, melts the hardest of hearts. Nothing's impossible, nor is anyone out of reach for God's love. 
And so over time, they, they, their hearts slowly melted and they gave their hearts to Jesus. Well, the time for their trial came, but they had processed so many things and they had forgiven their perpetrators too. So they said, we don't want to testify. And they realized that if we don't testify, these people will keep hurting kids. So they said, we'll do it. Because in human trafficking, a human testimony is the evidence. In drug trafficking and weapons, it's drugs and weapons. That's the evidence. But in human trafficking, you have to have a testimony. So they said, we'll testify, but we're going to ask God if there's any way, if there's any way we don't have to testify. God, will you just do it? Will you help us? But we'll do it if we have to. But, Father, we're going to trust you. And they had built a relationship with him. We're not going to stand between them and the Lord. He does the impossible. And so the time came all the way up to the trial date. No change. Took him to trial. And the legal team came out and said, you're not going to believe what's happening. He said, all the perpetrators who claimed and screamed and convinced everybody that they were innocent, they're all in there confessing. And confessing to crimes that the girls had, didn't even tell the police a year earlier about what was done to them. I'm, I'm machine gunning you this morning to build your faith wherever you're at. Whatever's happening in your life. That it's not just a religion, a choice. We don't come here just because we're family and we love each other. And that's beautiful. And that's just a side benefit of knowing God and his family. No, he's real for you and your everyday ordinary lives. We know almighty God and we have access to his throne room anytime we want. We're going to be so sorry when we go to heaven, when we see that at any moment we could, boom, step into his throne room and, ha and he will hear us the very instant that we speak that we didn't avail ourselves more to that. In 1 Peter 3, 12, it says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You know, it's hot out. I mean, it's cold out, and I'm still sweating. <laughs> wow. Um. I'm going to share with you, a lot of people say, you know, right now it's the financial struggles that we have. And oh my goodness, I totally know that. In fact, when COVID hit, we had a lot of loving business people call us and they were very concerned about Zoe's existence. Uh, would we even make it? Because the first thing that people stop giving to is a nonprofit. You give to your church first. You take care of your family. But a nonprofit, that's just, that's, you know. The last thing. And so, but what was really good is we would had 18 years of training of not having any money from day one. And, and for 18 years, God's paid every bill. And so the same threat and the same fear knocks at your door at every opportunity, many opportunities. But I, we have history with Almighty God. We've crossed the Red Sea, and we're not going to ever forget we, we've um, not been bitten by the lions when we are thrown into the den. We have history with God. He's faithful. And it, it's not that we just sit back. We engage with him. He's our source. He's our provider. He's our comfort. We can trust God. We can't trust anything else, but we can trust God. And so um, God has been so faithful during COVID, but we, about five years ago, God asked us to come home and open. Um, our U.S. staff grew from five people who, um, at, to over 40 people uh, by the end of this year because God asked us to come home and, and do what we're doing in other countries here, in particular um, to help kids who are trafficked. Actually, the US Presidential Task Force came to Thailand and came on our campus and said, how are these kids getting healed? How are they so help happy? What, what, 
because they weren't seeing uh, results, restoration results anywhere. But God, right? He's right, God. He's, we're no different from any other NGO doing this work. But our secret, our secret weapon, he's, it's the Lord. That's the only difference. And so we, we came home, prayed over God. What, where should we do this? Where should we start? He, we bought 50 acres about an hour north of Los Angeles. And uh, God supernaturally paid for that. And, and then getting the land ready to build our first home and multi-purpose building, those two needed to, in, in order for our program to even start, needed to be there. And uh, God paid for all the land. And now through COVID, we needed to finish it. And we're going to ribbon cut any, any minute now. Uh, about close to a $5 million project where, let me... Please look at me. We didn't have one penny. And we didn't do a campaign. We didn't do a campaign. We did a campaign years ago. One time, we were the land that we're on right now. We needed $1.6 million. And we put we all of our creative brilliance and all the intelligent, amazing people that we are and our team, and we put it together, and we did a campaign. And out of the $1.6 million that we needed, 30000 came in. And that's it. The rest came from heaven. People said, I was praying. And God said, and our board was praying. And God said, I, when the financial crisis hit in 2008, was it? Uh, we didn't even know there was a financial crisis. We don't even, because we don't look to man. We can't. We can't. No man could say they've done what Zoe's done. Nobody can take credit for that. Only God. We have a 33-acre campus in Thailand. We're in uh, Japan, Mexico, and Australia. No man could take credit, not any man. So uh, we needed, our architect design team said, hey, we just finished the plans. It's a trauma-informed design home for traffic girls here in Los Angeles. And so it's big and it's, and it's special. And he said it's going to cost about a million dollars. Well, to missionaries, you might have to say a gazillion dollars. But we, we were still... Still, we were training as warriors and as children of God. And, uh, you know, it, it, the fear tries to grab you. But we said, okay, we've heard that M word before many times. And so we said, Father, you've got that part because it, we're not enough. We'll never be enough for what God's asked us to do. We don't, we'll never have enough for what God asks us to do, right? Because he factors himself in to those plans, he factors himself in. We were never meant to do life apart or vision apart from him. We work for him. We work for him. Those are his plans. It's what he's asked us to do, but he only requires us to do what we can do. And so a million dollars is out of our, uh, it's above our pay grade. And so... Um, a week later, a little church, uh, no, uh, actually a large church contacted us in the valley, and they said, hey, uh, there's a couple here at our church. They're new, and we don't know who they are and what they want, but they want to meet a nonprofit or a missionary. Uh, we don't know why, but they want us to introduce them to somebody that we trust. They said, "We've been our church has been around for 35 years or 40 years, something like that. And so they have a lot of relationships they trust, and they didn't know us well. They were just vetting Zoe to see if they're going to get involved with us. And so they said, uh, there's no question. The Holy Spirit keeps saying, you take them to Zoe. You take them to Zoe. So we, I just want to know, are you available? It was a tiny little email. And... We happened to be in the country. We said, yes, bring them, you know. Their daughter was a missionary, so we thought it's maybe they needed some advice about that. And so they came, and we found out later the wife said, where are you taking us? And he said, well, they, do, they share the gospel, and then they combat human trafficking. 
oh, no, no, I, I'm not, that's too dark. I'm not interested in anything like that. They said, we already set the meeting. She said, okay, no problem. So they came, they're a little business couple, you know. And so we talked, and just to make a long story short, they left. Uh, the husband asked Michael, Michael, how much is the first home? Mike said, oh, we just found out. It's about a million dollars. Be ready. Whatever God has in your vision and in your heart, you got to be ready. If you're not ready, nobody, God won't send anybody your way. So make sure you're ready always. And so they, so they said, hey, can we go see the land? We said, sure. They went to the land. Then they left. I have no idea what they wanted. And so um, two days later on Tuesday morning, um, God, or the wife wrote a little email. No phone number, no address, nothing. She says, uh, this is their back story. They own a business and they put a little money aside every month to give to a missionary or a nonprofit. But there came a day when God said, I need you to hold that. I have a place for it. So they said, okay. They always prayed about where God was leading them. Well, there came the next month, the same thing. I have a place for that. Well, finally they said, Lord, they were panicked. And they were running around meeting every nonprofit and uh, missionary that they could find. God, is this it? God, is this it? Because they were sure they missed God. They were sure. And uh, so when they came to Zoe, uh, when they left, they said, let's not talk to each other. Let's go home and pray. They separated. They prayed, came back together and said, this is it. So where can we send you $1 million? No phone number, no address. Uh, so finally, I emailed her. I said, um, can, do you want to see our financials? Will you please see our financials? Is there anything that you need? How can, how, please. And so anyways, uh, they're wonderful. They hear from heaven. Thank God. And uh, all the money's come that way. We, we are ribbon cutting debt free. And we're nobody. Do you understand that? If you Google the, the uh, anti-trafficking organizations doing something, we're not on a, the list of 100. I just checked last night. We're nobody. But what list are we on? Heavens. We don't work to be seen by man, we work for the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. We have one commander in chief. And he, when he says to pray for our, those in authority, that's what we do. Pray for our president and those in authority. But we have one commander in chief and he is steady. And his economy is steady. Every, his word is gold. We're not shaken because he's not shaken. In Proverbs 3, 5 through 7, it says, Trust the Lord completely and do not rely on your own opinions. With all your heart, rely on him to guide you and he will lead you in every decision you make. Become intimate with him in whatever you do and he will lead you wherever you go. Don't think for a moment that you know it all. For wisdom comes when you adore him with undivided devotion. And avoid everything that's wrong. It's spelled out very clear how he does business. And how he involves himself. I, I need to cut this short. I went fast, but I don't think I'm going to be able to make it. But let me just say that um, in, in the end of March, when the threat really was there for us, uh, that April was going to be very bad, you're not going to be able to pay your bills, um, we got a little email at the end of March. And uh, this sweet single girl, her father had passed away in 2019, and she received an inheritance. She said in her email, she explains to us that she said, God, would, before I do with this money what I'm going to do with it, do you want me to give any of it? He said, yes, I want you to give some to Zoe, but I don't want you to give it until April of 2020. She said that was just the oddest instructions. It was so odd. Why would he say that? She said, I was, too, we know her. She said, I was too embarrassed to tell you. Oh, by the way, I'm going to be sending your offering next year in April. She said she was too embarrassed. She said, now I know. And she said, I want you to know that God has your back. The same father who I call father is your father. And whatever is happening in your life, read and know how he does life. We don't, we don't, uh, he doesn't come on board with us. We come on board with him. That's the secret. 
Not my will, Jesus said. What, not my will, but yours be done. We're going to do it your way, Father. Even Jesus. It's the secret. Oh, I have, we have one minute, honey. So do you want, I'm going to, I left you one minute. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> okay, let's pray. I think a lot of people have needs. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you might be struggling in areas of your life. Uh, Carol mentioned finances. We hear that from so many people nowadays. I'd like to pray for you. Um, I think there's a lot of people that maybe this uh, message resonated with that uh, you know, you want to just go to a whole nother level in your relationship with God. Maybe you've been, uh, you know, giving God a little bit of your life, but, you know, God has so much more. So I'd like to pray for you as well. So let's bow our heads. Father, we just come before you and we thank you so much for your word today. And Lord, we, we pray, first of all, for anybody that is just struggling in their relationship with you, Lord. Maybe they've uh, given you their heart, but they're not walking all the way. If that's you, then I just want you to reach out to God right now in your heart and say, Jesus, I'm giving you everything again. Maybe you walked with God before, and now it's time to come back and to really surrender your life fully, 100%. It's worth it. Give it all to Jesus. He's got so much for you. God has the most amazing plan for your life And as you do, you'll experience this miraculous, amazing power of God in your life like you've never experienced before. So, Father, I pray for those people that you will just just touch them right now, Lord, where they're at. May your Holy Spirit just move in them and upon them, Father. And Father, we pray for people's finances, Lord, those that are struggling. They might be out of jobs or they got laid off father but you are our provider lord even in the midst of a famine you can provide for every need lord because the earth is the lord's and the fullness thereof you own it all father we don't need to look to man to support us but we look to you so reach out with your faith dig deep into your heart you have faith you're a believer so believe god just trust him even though the circumstances are against you And Father, last, I want to pray for those that maybe you've gone through trauma. You heard about these stories of these kids that have just gone through hell and back. And yet, Jesus touched their heart and is restoring them and making them whole again. If that's you, maybe you've gone through hell in your life. You've been abused and mistreated and gone through terrible things. God sees it all. He wants to heal you right now. The Bible, Jesus said that he is the healer of broken hearts. He came to heal the brokenhearted. So reach out right now to Jesus. Lord, just touch them with your mighty power that the Holy Spirit will go deep in their soul and just liberate them, Father, from those bondages. Break every chain in the name of Jesus. We come against you, Satan, and all your work in the lives of the people. We break it and we for forbid you to any longer hold them captive and we just ask for the healing power of God to touch them in Jesus name. Amen.